Gad Saad is a professor, author, YouTube creator, defender of free speech and secular ideas, known as the Gadfather. <laughs> And he's spreading the sad truth. I think you're going to spread a little of it right here. Thank you so much for having me again. So I, I'm very excited to talk to you. I say that to all my guests because I'm always excited to talk to people, but I particularly mean it today because you joined me for the first test show right. uh, all the way back in August. Uh, people think that Sam Harris was the first guest, but technically, Gad Sad was the first. And the first repeat guest. So you now are the first, you were the first <laughs> guest, you were the first repeat guest. And, and you're doing so much cool stuff in, in this space. Thank you. This, this sort of, uh, what, what do we want to call ourselves now? What space are we in? Uh, fighters of good ideas. I like that. Fighters of good ideas. All right. So I want to get into uh, the work that you do. I want to talk about your books. I want to talk about your tweets. And I want to talk about your YouTube channel. Uh, but I saw you do an interview with Asra Nomani, uh, which was really, really fascinating. Talk about your history. Uh, so you were born in Lebanon, and I'm going to let you take it away. From right. There. So I was born in Lebanon, uh, late 1964. So now everybody knows my age. There you go. Um, lived there for 11 years. Then the civil war broke out in the mid 70s. It became very, very difficult to be Jewish in Lebanon, uh, and so we really had to leave under imminent threat of execution. In Lebanon, everybody carries an internal ID card. Uh, very much like a passport, but for, for the country itself. And on that ID card is stated very clearly what your religion is. And so if you were stopped at particular roadblocks f by militia who were not sympathetic to you being Jewish, it wasn't going to turn out well. And as you might imagine, most of the militia at that point, you know, you wouldn't have cleared those roadblocks. And so we really needed to leave. And so we left Lebanon. Um, the day that we left Lebanon and we cleared the airspace of... Uh, well, Lebanon, uh, the, as the captain had mentioned it, uh, my wife, uh, my, not my wife, my mother takes out a Star of David, puts it around my neck and says, now you don't have to hide who you are. Okay, so let's, let's back up before you, we get to your escape, because right. before your escape, there was some pretty amazing stuff that happened. So your parents were kidnapped by PLO terrorists, Later. Right? Later. Okay. So we, we emigrated to Canada in late 75. Okay. Then for the next four years, my parents kept going back and forth from Montreal to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. They really couldn't extricate themselves fully from their previous life in Lebanon. And on one of those trips in 1980, they were kidnapped by uh, Fatah. Yeah. Uh, you had a guest, Tariq Fatah, but of no relation. <laughs> no, no relation. relation. No relation. Uh, but Fatah is sort of, now it's considered the, the moderate version, right. yes. the moderate to Hamas. Yes. Or, yeah. Moderate in the Middle East is a very uh, tentative uh, term. Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> and so they were kidnapped. They disappeared for, uh, I think it was eight days. Uh, at the time that it was happening, when my siblings, who are much older than me, were trying to find a way to rescue them or even know if they're still alive, I had been lied to. I was told that they had some financial problems. That's why there was so much upheaval in the house. So during those eight days when my parents had disappeared, I didn't know that they were potentially, you know, dead. Yeah. Uh, when they were finally rescued, they were rescued actually because my mother's best friend at the time, her name was Ahsan, uh, was the personal dresser of Hafiz al-Assad. And so through those connections, uh, we were able to pinpoint which militia group had them, and yeah. I guess... Was he the president of uh, Lebanon he was, at the time? Or? No, he was the president of Syria. Uh, the president of Syria. Oh, of the president course, of Syria. Of and then through him, I think uh, Yasser Arafat got involved, and uh, finally they found him. They were with a group uh, led by Abu Nidal. I'm going on my memory here from when I was 15. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, they were rescued. And I think one of the things that you might remember from the story with uh, my discussion with Asra, uh, when my parents were eventually rescued, uh, my father had a severe injury from having been beaten with a Kalashnikov, and he had a temporary stroke, a paralysis in his face, which mm -hmm. eventually uh, subsided. And in my mother's case, I remember that one of the things that had really uh, disturbed me as a 15-year-old young male was whether she had been raped. Mm -hmm. And I remember that shortly after they were rescued and came to, back to Montreal, I asked her, the only time I've ever brought up the subject, and she said that while they repeatedly threatened her psychologically with rape, that they hadn't raped her. And I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. And we just sort of dropped the subject and never raised it again. Yeah, so I don't know that you can know the answer to this, but what were, what were they trying to get out of your parents? What was the advantage of, of taking expats that were now Canadians 
and kidnapping them. Yeah, great. Actually, it's one of the seven deadly sins of greed. One of the, uh, the owner of a building where my father had a store in the lobby was trying to lowball my father to sell the store. And thinking that, of course, as Jews, they were in a very precarious situation, he had hired these militia to try to extract from them a confession that they were Israeli spies. And the only thing, and then if they would then execute them as Israeli spies, somehow magically he could get that uh, store. Luckily for my parents, of course, they didn't confess to that because they're not Israeli spies. And yeah. that's what kept them alive for those eight days because there was an ulterior motive to get them to sign those confessions. Wow, that, that's really incredible. So now I know why I jumped ahead with the story about your parents because what happened to you getting out of Lebanon I thought was fascinating. So you were talking about going through the checkpoints and being right. in a car. Yes. And, and you have a very foggy memory of exactly what So happened. I remember very, very well. Actually, we had hired PLO militia. I mean, you think about the guys that you see today, the ISIS guys, how they look. Yeah. Well, I've, that's what I grew up with. Yeah. Now, those guys were contracted to drive us to the airport uh, precisely because by close to the Beirut International Airport, there were a lot of militia checkpoints of Palestinians. And there was no way you're going to get through that if, the, if they weren't sympathetic to, to you. So, but of course, they could take you and they could take you to a ditch and shoot you. So you don't really know what's going to happen. So I remember being picked up by these guys. I remember getting to the airport and then the story would end the, on the plane. Yeah. But everything in between, I have zero recollection of that. And I once asked my uh, parents, you know, what, what happened? And she said that uh, we, as we were going through different neighborhoods that would have been hostile to Palestinian militia, for example, Christian groups, mm -hmm. uh, the, everybody was engaging one another, very much like a Rambo movie. We were at the bottom of the floor of the car, sort of being hidden. All of that, I have zero recollection of that. Yeah, it, it's so fascinating because it shows you how complex the entire situation with <laughs> Lebanon and the Palestinians and the Israelis is because you had, you had Palestinian militia people being paid off to help Jews escape <laughs> Lebanon because of their civil right. war. I mean, it really, if you, yeah. if you map this whole thing, people will go, this, this makes no right. sense. Well, I, I off, I've actually uh, written about this that, you know, Muslims were trying to kill us and Muslims saved us, right? So you can't sort of have a blanket statement, you know, all Muslims, right? That's a Oh, so you don't believe in all Muslims are bad. <laughs> okay, glad. I'm there glad you we go. got that out right at there the beginning go. because uh, we don't want you right. to be misquoted. Right. So you must feel uh, sort of very strange when uh, right now, you know, Hezbollah is sort of taking over Lebanon and they're fighting in Syria and that's your home country and it's teetering on democracy or it's democracy, I should say, is teetering. Uh, right. How do you feel about Lebanon now? And you must be I, it. Do you I do so much. I, you know, my, I have two children. Uh, so between my wife and I, we speak five languages. So I speak French, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. She speaks English, French, and Armenian. Wow. And yet our children only speak French and English because by virtue of living in Montreal. And I really regret the fact that we don't have the opportunity to take our children back to Lebanon. For example, one year visiting professorship at American University of Beirut, you know, dumped them in that context. They could come back fluent Arabic speaker. Yeah. Speakers. Could, could you do it though? Is there... Because, because of the political situation? or uh, there... You know, in, Le in Beirut, if you make a left turn here, then there's an ISIS recruitment center perhaps. I mean, you don't know who's the nice guy, who's the bad guy, right? It yeah. won't take much for people to find out, number one, that I'm Jewish, number two, that I've written quite forcefully about some of these issues. Uh, it's very easy for you to disappear in the trunk of a car, right? So yeah. I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable, given the current situation, to take a risk. Now, I've been told, I have a lot of friends that have said, look, we can guarantee your security, come back, and so on. Can you really? So so I'd rather not, and certainly not when I have young children. Right. So before the, the Civil War, and I know you were you were 12 when it happened, so you were pretty young. 11. 11. Do you, what, what was it like to be Jewish there? Right. I mean, it was actually okay? So that, that's, that's a very interesting issue because oftentimes people will say, oh, but Jews were treated very nicely. I mean, yes, nicely in the sense that there aren't daily decapitations in the, in the square hall, in the center square, <laughs> right. right? You could go about your business, but everything is nice until the decapitations happen, right? Yeah. So uh, you were tolerated, right? I mean, people knew you were Jewish. Yeah. They didn't necessarily bother you every day, but anti-Semitism pervades you know, the fabric of every possible element of society in those regions. Yeah. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that everybody's an anti-Semite, but, you know, you ju just be quiet. Don't, don't signal your belongingness to this group. You know? yeah. Be understated. 
Yeah, and then once the Civil War happened, sort of the rules were just changed, right? Oh, is of that course. is that what it was? Basically, you guys felt that whatever side wins this thing, we're, we're finished. Uh, I mean, there there were Jews that were killed, and it would have only been a matter of time where somebody would have found us and, and killed us. Yeah. And so it really was under imminent threat of execution. I mean, we either get out or die. Yeah. So I know that a certain amount of people will be watching this and will say, "Well, wait, I don't understand because Gad is an extremely outspoken atheist." Right but he's here repeated several times that you're Jewish. Right. How do you reconcile that? Because I've had a few people on, I've had Ali Rizvi, who's an atheist Muslim, and right. we talked about how he reconciles it. Uh, and there's been a couple other people where we, the way I reconcile it for myself, how, how do you reconcile that? So the way I would answer that is that Judaism, or to be Jewish, is a multifaceted identity. There is a cultural element, there is a historical element, there is a, a shared, you know, uh, uh, context, history. history. There's just a shared history. Shared history, history yeah. Yeah. shared lineage. Uh, one of which is adherence to a set of religious doctrines. And so I could choose to ignore those doctrines and still say, I do belong to a group of people uh, that can be traced back in this manner through a genealogy, right? And so in that sense, I'm very Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, but in the religious element, I'm not at all Jewish. Yeah, do you think you don't get a certain cred of being from the Middle East because of that? Because there's a sense, and, and we're gonna sit down with yeah. Lalo Degasha a little bit later, but you know, I've known him online, for over a year, I just, because he said that he had Palestinian ancestry, I just assumed he was Muslim. I didn't know until we met two weeks ago right. at dinner that his family actually was Christian. And that was just a silly and sloppy thinking on my part. Right. Um, but do you feel that you sort of don't get some of the cred of being a real Middle Easterner? Uh, I mean, it, d it depends on who you're speaking well, I guess to. from the people on the left that uh, we spend so much time thinking right. about. Right. Uh, you know, once I break down the, break, break down with the flawless Arabic, then those kinds of concerns that, go away, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's quite impressive for somebody to accuse you of that <laughs> where, when your mother, I mean, everything about us is Arabic. I mean, yes, we happen to be Jewish, but I mean, you know, culturally we're, we're Arabic, right? We're yeah. Arab Jews. So it's very difficult for people to levy that charge. Although I have an interesting uh, personal anecdote. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, a doctoral student at uh, Cornell, uh, I became friends with a lot of Arabic students. Uh, as would typically happen because I have more in common with them than I might have with the Jewish guy from Poland, right? right? Sure. Uh, and so at one point, one of these uh, guys, we, we had gone for a coffee, he said to me, uh, you know, I really, I really like you, Gad. I said, well, why do you say that as though you're so surprised? He said, well, you know, because, well, you know, because you're Jewish. But you know, but you're not a Jew, Jew. <laughs> right. Right. I said, no, no, I'm a Jew, 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 Jew. He goes, no, no, come on, you know what I mean, you're not a Jew. So in yeah. that case, what he was saying is you're not really the archetype of what I imagine a Jew to be. You're really Arabic. Yeah. And so it's the opposite of what you asked. I, I think all of this is so fascinating. And the reason I like talking about it, it's very similar to what I was discussing with Tarek Fatah a few days ago, that identity is so malleable, actually. Right. It's so not necessarily your religion or your history or even your ethnicity or where you were born or nationality, because it's, it's all of those things. Right. And I guess that's why I hate identity politics right. so much, because I realize that most people are like you or like me that pick and choose what to believe and, and that secular values ultimately are the things right. that should move us forward as right. a society. Speaking of identity politics, uh, and privilege scores. I should mention that get I, all your privilege I, I, up now. I've lost some points because I'm, my skin is a bit lighter than <laughs> in summer, but I've made sure to put on a bit of weight so that I could gain on the fatism score. Uh. So it all see it's an it's a homeostatic mechanism whereby I maintain my victimology score at a certain point. Right, but the but the fat thing is way lower on the list than the, the, the skin bound, color okay. thing, right? So I'll, I'll bring it back. And more. then the religion <laughs> things up here, depending on what religion, it's such a people should be walking around with cards and you That's can just right. hand it to them and be like, well, here's my shit and my right. underprivileged. That's right. I, I did a thing on BuzzFeed the other day right. about privilege. Privilege. Did you see this on Buzzfeed? I didn't see chance? it. They did it, how privileged are you? And I got a 42 out of 100. It said I wasn't privileged at all. Now is that That's pretty great. I'm not yeah. privileged. I thought, I'm gonna, I gotta that's, tell people about this. I'm off the charts on that one. Yeah, you'd, be, you'd get a negative six. I'm, I'm fantastic, yeah. yeah.